So I guess the question is, have we finally found the Holy Grail, an amplifier that can provide enough juice and enough control to go from something like this all the way to the absolute top end, one of the most hard to drive headphones on the planet, one of the most difficult headphones to drive correctly, the Hi-Fi Mensas Varas. From the Japanese company Bakun International, deriving Enlum 23R, their successor to the infamous 13R, Convince Me Audio brings you the review of this. Let's dive in. First and foremost, a special thank you to Jez. The gentleman honestly only had it at his desk for 24 hours before it was shipped across to the reviewers in the UK. Mate, you're an absolute legend. So this super flagship headphone amplifier slash speaker amplifier comes in at 5,000 pounds, roughly about $6,500. If you are interested in this unit, check out Mimic Cables down below. All of his description will be there uh, and you will get a nice discount because of CMA. Obviously there's no kickbacks to the channel as I stated previously, but I've managed to get this little peek for you guys because of the CMA viewers. And first and foremost, I would like to extend a special thank you to those viewers who I met at Canjam London. That was a surreal experience. My goodness, we just came back from that last weekend and that was absolutely astonishing. So we heard pretty much everything under the sun and it was, what an event. So. Let's get back onto the Enlium. Enlium. All right, let's see if we can pronounce this. Enlium. Enlium. The South Korean company that derived from Bakun International from Japan has come up with this beautiful, beautiful amplifier. Now, this unit, let's actually do a tour first before we get onto the specifications, etc. This is the remote. Previously, I thought Serene Remote was one of the best remotes I had seen on the planet, but this really does kind of take it up a notch. This is probably three times as heavy. No rattling from the buttons itself. Very clicky and very, very, very basic. As you can see, input selector plus power and volume. Now, this uh, remote is very necessary for the unit because it allows you to go from low gain to high gain with this unit. The remote control, is it worthy of six and a half thousand dollars? Hell yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen another remote that is built like this and feels like this. You could kill someone with this thing. This is absolutely nuts. So you go over meow, we don't need you any longer. This is the amplifier itself. Heavy little beast. And look at this beautiful etching, most likely upside down. So let me show you like this, just in case it is. Here we go. Now, starting with the front of the unit, I will get to those funny feet in a, mo in a moment because there is an actual purpose for them. Uh, we've got this stepped attenuated volume control here that actually is motorized. And as you're going up with a volume on the unit, this thing spins and every time you disconnect a pair of headphones, the volume goes right back down to zero by itself. It's a little like magic, it's a, it's a really nice touch. And then you've got this beautiful design on the sides of the amplifier, and finally we get to the unit's rear. She got back, she ain't got much back. So, we have a pair of inputs, one and two, and a pair of BNC inputs. This is for their own proprietary DACs, I don't think have even been released yet. I think it's under development. Then we have a normal AC power. And I think this might be international. I honestly don't know. I need to check on that. Um, if it is, I'll put it down in the comment section. Uh, I don't think it's a UK 230V thing. I think this might be international and does automatic switching. And then we have these very high end binding posts. And that's it. Flipping the unit over, we have these three feet that screw on like so, and these wobble as well. It's so that the unit has been weighed so carefully, 
and put it nice back on here like this. The unit has been weighed so, so carefully that it provides the most perfect balance for the central point of the unit. And not only that, it dampens vibrations as well. Absolutely no vibrations as you're put, uh, running your hand across the unit when power is uh, on. And I found that really intriguing because I felt vibration on some of the units behind us, as you can see, meow and meow. Uh, this unit all has four little feet as well. Yoink! Rubber feet, so if you want to mitigate those big feet, which I think cost extra, they're like 150 pounds extra, but I do not recommend that in any shape or form. And because this unit gets hot, I mean, class A, set fire to your hands kind of hot. Honestly, uh, it gets to the point where it gets so hot that if you put your hands on it like this for more than in like 30 seconds, you will feel it. You will genuinely feel it, but be that as it may. Enough room underneath for air circulation, sides. Do not put this in a tight location or stack other DACs on top of it. I had the uh, DAC3B, the IFI Signature and the Cord TT2, which currently is back with its owner, Mo. Thank you so much for lending that to us. There's vents at the back here, by the way, too. Um, and I was terrified because as soon as I touched those units after two minutes, they felt like they were being set on fire. So don't do that. Honestly, I think you might need to put this in the rack mount kind of placement. And then once you do that, uh, have enough room all around it so it can breathe. Uh, forgot to mention, a 6.3 jack at the front as well, which is basically what we're talking about. I mean, this channel at the moment reviews IEMs, yeah, headphones, yeah, and uh, DACs and amplifiers. We haven't touched speakers just yet due to our location. But trust me, those will be coming. Let's talk about specifications of this unit. I mean, uh, it's it's a very basic unit, genuinely basic. Um, we are running 25 watts into eight ohms, 45 watts into four ohms, four watts into 60 ohms, high five and says varas. The, what are you, what are you, where are you? Oh, they're no longer here, damn it. The firm or stack, eight watts into 60 ohms, so far more powerful than this unit, and those, could be used as uh, speaker amplifiers because the XLRs at the back could output as a little unit, um, but this is more traditional. This is binding post type of uh, passive speakers, but those speakers have to be pretty freaking sensitive because you are looking at 25 watts into eight ohms. But most of our testing here, obviously, as you know, has been on headphones, especially this beast, the hi fi Mansas Varas. You will find the distortion levels and all of the measurements scrolling down. Meow. Thank you, Bitwolf. And pause the video to have a look through those. To be honest, none of that matters to us. What matters is the end point. How has this been performing? What does it sound like? And do we finally, finally have an headphone amplifier that can take us from an IEM at our desk to our hi fi Varas without the need for those, point in the right direction, bruh, and the need for the pre, obviously you're gonna need a DAC, so the may will still have to stick around, or one of the other DACs that I mentioned earlier. All of the reviews for those, I think if they're out already, check them out down below. So how has this been performing? First and foremost, the hype for this unit has been so real, it's been ridiculous. I honestly was anticipating this to replace my monoblock benchmarks for the Sesvaras and the need for the Serene Pre and everything else and have this tiny footprint. It feels as though we are in Silicon Valley and every bit of real estate is really important on my desk at the moment because the Nutless and the KNHA300 Mark II is on the way. So trust me, I, I am, I'm panicking about space. The question whether it does or not will be answered at the end of the review. Chapters obviously as usual. But let's take this unit one step at a time. Let's get an overall sound characteristic of this amplifier first. For the first time in my experience, I can describe this amplifier in one word or two. V shaped. It's weird. You have a V shaped amplifier. 
That's the sound characteristics of this amplifier and it's very, very DAC dependent. Going from one of those DACs to the other has been quite challenging to actually find the right synergy with this because they've all sounded so different and to be honest with you, none of them sounded too special. It's kind of bizarre saying that. This amplifier is V-shaped. But let's break this down. The treble region on this amplifier is probably one of the best I've heard and I'm talking about including the solid state amplifiers I heard at Kanjam. It's ultra detailed, it's smooth, it's extraordinarily forward, it's very very emphasized and it's very articulate. Absolutely insane for tactility, for transience and for airiness and for showing you what the top part of the track in the treble region is doing. Going down below, the sub bass to the mid bass to the upper bass region is controlled. Textured, violent, huge sounding on the Hi-Fi Mensa's Varus. In fact, I think it just nips at the heel of the 100 watt benchmark AHB2. Against the monoblock AHB2s, it falls behind a tiny bit more for coherency uh, because you're completely eliminating crosstalk there. But honestly, if you had not heard those, you would be not missing anything. So first and foremost, does it drive Sasvaras? Yes, perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. Whether the performance tone is to your liking, we're going to explore that in a moment. But for detail, for resolution, for speed, for impact, for perfect driver force, yes, it drives Sasvaras perfectly. On the other end of the spectrum, IEMs, I've only got the S12s unfortunately here right now, but a slew of IEMs is coming from manufacturers in the next few weeks, so watch out for those. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Press the notification icon so that it pisses you off and uh, you get alerted to everything that we do here if it's your thing. If not, just peruse your feed and hopefully we'll be there somewhere. Um, YouTube is still trying to suffocate us and we're trying to climb out from under it. it, it it's honestly like being under a bus at the moment with the algorithm, but we're doing our best. Um, so. No noise floor for IEMs, it drives them obviously perfectly on low gain and you don't need to worry about anything. So you can throw your flagship IEMs on this unit as well as your Hi-Fi Mensa's Varas. But let's break down the frequency response and discuss some of the caveats. We're gonna do this with one of our favorite tracks of the channel that breaks equipment such as amplifiers and DACs. Hans Zimmer's Pirates of the Caribbean Suite from Kobuz, a two-parter which will be linked down below so you can follow along. Okay, starting with the sub bass. You've got perfect separation and you've got perfect position within the stage. Um, there is authority for those horns and for those strings that impact right away as the track starts. The first thing you're aware of is the sub bass category has got this tendency to showcase the reverb that's been added to that instrument right there from the stadium and from the instrument and from the, uh, I think there's like a sampler that's been added on just to give it a touch more reverb. Or it might be a reverberation of the actual stadium, it's rather difficult to tell, but it announces it within that instrument right there perfectly. And the thing is, it does not collide with a reverb coming from the other instruments there. And that's really shocking. I've not heard that on any other solid state where you get separate reverberation from each other without it colliding and coinciding and becoming discordant. Full authority for vibration of the eardrums from the Hi-Fi Mensa's Varas. And if you're driving these and if you're not driving these well, these don't feel like they have much impact or the dr eardrum reverberation, but on this, oh yes they do. If an instrument and if a note ends suddenly, you've got that end to that note. If you've got trailing notes because the note is decaying across and spanning across the stage, 
you've got access to that information as well. It's a spectacle. Mid bass on this is authoritative, it's punchy, it's visceral, and it's very well announced. Tactile information from this mid bass category is almost touchable, very focused, right there if it needs to be right there, right there if the instrument applies for it and asks for it right here. It does not cascade here and you've got the reverberation and the reflection and inflection from the stage within this environment that's around us. This puts out a nice big stage. I don't think it's as big as the AHP2, but it has a very big stage. So stage is wonderful within the bass region. It's very articulate, it's very controlled. And I had absolutely no problems with the bass region on any headphones. Climbing up to the upper bass region, perfect control again. Does it bleed into the mids? No, but the mids is a whole different scenario which we'll get onto after the treble region because I need to come back to that. Drums, tom-toms is never light sounding, is never thin sounding, it's got full authority. It's focused and it's exactly there where it needs to be. It does not come forward too much so that it clashes with the lower mid range and it does not go back too much, providing a very large end of the spectrum in the treble region where things sound a bit thin. This is a really good characteristics of the treble region. This is a fantastic performance from the sub bass, mid bass and upper bass region. The lower mid range is forward. Climbing up to the mid mids and then upper mids, it comes forward. Most of the focus of this amplifier is in the bass and in the treble, but very well controlled, very well articulated and very well detailed. The treble region on this amplifier is probably some of the best I've ever heard on a solid state. Let's go on as we mean to with the Hans Zimmer track because as that track is crescendoing, you got the vocals from the males and the females and it separates both of them perfectly. You got the upper register of the horns without it colliding. It separates them beautifully without the need for turning the volume down because it becomes a bit too much. No, it separates them beautifully. It's smooth, it's articulate, and it's extraordinarily well detailed so that you can see right into the heart of the mix from the treble all the way down to the sub bass. And it feels as though it's like a clear glass window. No discordance in the sounds from this frequency. And because of the hi-fi as far as driver capability that it reproduces, you hear the articulation of the upper end trailing notes beautifully with the cascading effect of the stage and the upper region and the airiness, absolutely no problems. Forward, yes. Smooth, yes. Detailed, yes. Are you missing anything? No. Sub bass, mid bass, upper bass, forward, forced, forceful, attacking, visceral, tactility. Yes, yes, yes. Are you missing anything? No. So what's the problem? My problem with this amplifier is the mid range. Let's discuss this. Mid range on this amplifier is almost non-existent. And what I mean by that, it's flat. Not flat neutral, just flat as in dead flat. This is the second variant of the 23R. I have seen raving reviews about the 23R and I've got a feeling that might be in the first generation. So I'm holding my reservations. This review is only for this unit. And if another unit of a V1 or another edition, and if Elenium themselves reach out to us and say, this review is inaccurate, we're gonna send you another unit for review, please assess, I will be happy to reassess. Because this footprint is insane. Four kilograms, by the way, with wobbly feet. But as soon as you put it down, because of the vibration thing, it deadens. Let's talk about the mid-range now, sorry, sidetrack. Um, 
You got no tactility, no texture, no lusciousness, no forwardness. It seems recessed and pushed all the way over there. So I'm pushing forward. So that doesn't mean towards you, it means actually away from me, so it's maybe better to go this way. So you've got the treble region coming forward like this, you've got the bass region forward and forceful like this, and you've got the mid-range back there, which is uh, very unfortunate. I'm a mid-range guy, I love instruments in this category, I want to feel its texture, I want it to feel it in here, I want to feel it in my heart and in my chest and in my soul. I want to hear every articulation of rhythm guitars, of instruments that reside in the lower mids, upper mids and mid mids. I'm getting none of that. I'm getting a beautiful representation of the bass and the treble and nothing from the mid range. Dynamic range of the mid range is just dead flat. I don't like it at all. No engageability. It's improved with listening time over the last week, or maybe I'm just getting used to it, but no. It's just lifeless. And especially if you're listening to a lot of tracks that have a lot of mid-range, you tend to be just focusing and you just go, oh, that's interesting in the treble region. Oh, wow, that's incredible in the bass region. Oh, wow, that's really transparent. And you realize you've lost all the soul. I realized this entire week on this with this amplifier, I've just been concentrating on how things look, how things feel, how things sound, and absolutely no engageability. So very, very sad. The hype was real. This was gonna be what was gonna be on my desk as my solid state. Uh, so tiny, so beautiful. Reminds me of the TT2. By the way, the TT2 sits perfectly on this. So it's as if it's made for it, but I am terrified of the heat that rises off this to put the TT2 on top of it, but it sits on it perfectly. Okay, so what are the problems? Well, the problems being putting this unit into high gain to low gain, you have to hold the menu button until it clicks for three seconds, press volume down and then hold it again. You think that's a simple solution, right? And it's nice. I want a switch on here to do that, like the AHP2s. But putting this unit from high gain to low gain, low gain to high gain, even though it resets itself every time you disconnect the headphones, which is very, very inconvenient, like extremely inconvenient, is a mission. It works one time out of 10 on this unit. You hold it, it the relay is supposed to go click, Press down and then hold it again. But what happens is, as you're holding it, all it's doing is cycling through the inputs um, until you hit that perfect point of that timing it requires. It's kind of bizarre. Even after a week, I still haven't managed to do it every single time that I wanted to. Every time it's been faffing around, that's been annoying. The second caveat of this unit is very frustrating, is the attenuation. Every time you go up, you get pock, 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 like the Death on Ray honey in your ears. When you're throwing a $6,000 headphones on your amplifier, that's something you never want to hear. I don't think it did any damage to my headphones, but I don't want to hear that. Every time you increase the volume, that pock, 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 as the attenuation and the gain control is going up and up and up and up, you're hearing it. And I don't like that in my drivers at all and in IEMs, in headphones, it does it across the board for everything and that is a problem. This is six and a half thousand. That's the same price as a used BMW 3 Series. So yes, problematic. Third problem being this unit gets ultra hot. So I'm a bit terrified of putting anything on top unless their own proprietary DAC that takes advantage of the 75 ohm BNC connections at the back with these enormous long feet is provided for you. I don't like putting any other DACs from any other manufacturer on top of this unit because it gets too hot. It's, it's like an oven. In fact, it gets much, much, much hotter than my May and the May gets very hot. So worrisome. But uh, putting this on top of the May was no issue because of that huge space underneath the unit with these big, big legs. So yes, that could be problematic for some people. And finally, the biggest problem, the biggest caveat, I could put up with all of those genuinely because I love this. I love the performance of this unit. It performs 
unlike anything else I've heard solid state wise, is the mid-range problem. That mid-range problem for me is problematic. So what are the other caveats? DACs, the May sounded awful on this. It sounded sticky, gooey, and meh. Tonal balance was off. I did not like it in the slightest. It just felt weird and ultra V-shaped sounding. It was kind of bizarre. I really did not like it. Switching over to the IFI signature, IDST Pro from uh, IFI behind me, Synergy was better. Uh, whether you were using the tube plus mode or just solid state mode, edge of attack was wonderful. May was soft, the signature was visceral, hard hitting and really impactful. In fact, between those and the DAC freebie were the two DACs I wanted on this amplifier most of all, and they were used most of all during the entire review. Edge of attack was wonderful, stage was big, still with the same problem of the V-shaped uh, flat mid-range. Even when going to tubes, still, still. It digs it out a little bit more, but still kind of lifeless in that region. The DAC-3B, incidentally, has been the best performer on this unit. Uh, it really shows you detail, transparency, layering, a visceral attack. Same flat mid-range. But tonally, I preferred it. But timbre-wise, the May still had the best timbre on this amplifier, surpassing the benchmark and surpassing the IFI. The TT2 on this was pretty pleasant with a warm filter as well, still with the same problem of that mid-range. So it carries its sonic characteristics across the board with DACs. Those are all the caveats I have. Now let's talk about pairing with headphones. I alluded to the Sesvaras being driven perfectly on this amplifier, and it has. It's been, it's been tested with this amplifier more than any other headphone because that's what I wanted it for, to be fair with you. But the LCD5 on this unit exacerbates the upper mid-range so it becomes shouty, shrill, treble forward, but with fantastic bass response. All that beautiful mid-range is lost, and I did not listen for more than an hour. I couldn't handle it. It was a no-no. Definitely. The Focal Utopia on this had fantastic bass response. Excellent, excellent resolvability in the treble region. You could hear every dust almost landing on the fretboard of a guitar. Mid-range was utterly lost again. So the Utopias sounded ultra, ultra V-shaped. I'm not a fan of V-shaped. I, I just am not. Sorry. And the Utopia on tubes, I think that review should be out shortly, is incredible. But on this unit, meh. The best performing headphone on this unit has been the Hi Fi Men's Asvaras. There's a tiny dip in the 2.5k region on the Hi Fi Men's Asvaras. For some reason, this didn't exacerbate it, uh, but it really accentuated the resolution and detail of the treble region and the incredible bass response. My goodness, bass sounds good on Sasvaras on this unit. It will provide your Sasvaras with enough juice to use this properly instead of a speaker amplifier like behind me and you have no need for a pre either. You will definitely have to go into high gain mode because low gain will top out around 73 dB on hi fi and Sasvaras and maxing it out. And do not max out any amplifier to its full limits please, because you don't want to be driving anything that hard. Go to high gain, you've got full volume control in your hands, and you've got wonderful performance. Though, going to high gain mode on every headphone sounded a bit more clinical and a little bit less sweet than the lower gain region on this amplifier. Conclusion. What do I think of this? I think this is a beautifully designed inside and out amplifier. I think for the right audience, it's right up their alley. I want to test the V1 because I think I don't like this V2. But for the right audience who don't care much about mid-range and don't mind having a flat mid-range, 
this is perfect because it will drive your IEMs to your Sasvaras absolutely perfectly. No issues whatsoever. But if you're into mid or mid-range, if you want to feel the soul of your music, if you're not just into electronic EDM and stuff, or you want to analytically listen every time you sit at the desk, this amplifier is not for you. It's not fair. Every single time I feel there's a one box solution for my Sasvaras all the way down to IEMs across the board, there's always got to be something wrong. So we're left with all the stuff you see behind us. So meh is the answer to that question. But what is the standouts of this amplifier? The standouts of this amplifier I would say is the sonic characteristic is unlike any other solid state I've heard. It combines the performance of tubes, the holographic nature, which I have not come across on other solid states, the layering, absolutely insane. The detail in the treble region is off the freaking charts. Incredible bass response. It's a unique sounding unit that is unlike anything else you've heard, genuinely. But for me personally, if the mid-range was on the level of the bass and treble, I would have bought this within the first hour of switching it on. But the fact it isn't, I'm still hunting. So let's do the Tiger scores. Build quality, five Tigers out of five. Price to performance ratio, four Siberian Tigers out of five. Usability, functionality, software. Two tigers out of five. There are some quirks I do not like in the slightest. And overall, for a $6,500 integrated headphone dash speaker amplifier, three tigers out of five. If the mid range and those software issues and the poc 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 nature was perfected five tigers out of five i would have bought this so that's been the 23r from enlu i would like to take a moment to thank our patreon members for keeping the private telegram chat alive thank you so much for your support your assistance has been helping the channel shipping these products back and forth to their owners i really do appreciate every bit of help it was wonderful seeing new viewers at can jam I was so excited and so overwhelmed how many people had heard of Convince Me Audio. We are still a very small channel and the reception was absolutely mind-bogglingly incredible. Can't wait to see and meet many, many more of you. I'm Koji CEO. I will see you next time. Peace.